This morning, the Security Council heard a briefing on Mali. El Gassimwane, the special representative of the Secretary General and head of the peacekeeping mission in Mali, updated council members on MINUSMA's withdrawal from the country at the request of the Malian authorities and subsequent Security Council resolutions to end the mission's mandate. He confirmed that our base in Minaka was successfully closed on Friday and returned to the governor as the designated civilian authority representing the transitional government of Mali. Uh, this closure, along with the recent returns at camps at uh, Ogusagu in the Biandiagara region of central Mali and Bear and Gudam sites in Timbuktu, ends the first phase of the withdrawal process. In his remarks today, Mr. Wane said, that closing a mission built over a decade in a period of six months is a complex and ambitious endeavor, which includes closing 12 camps, one temporary operating base, withdrawing close to 13,000 uniformed peacekeepers, civilian staff, as well as withdrawing the equipment, especially the contingent-owned equipment. Uh, anyway, at 2 p.m. this afternoon, Mr. Wane will join us virtually uh, from Mali, and he'll be here to brief you uh, and answer all of your questions on the ongoing withdrawal. Some good news to share with you about the situation around the Safar tanker. Earlier today, the team that stabilized the decaying Safar tanker and transferred more than 1.1 million tons of, uh, excuse me, one more, a little, let's try that again. Um, earlier today, the team that stabilized the decaying uh, Safar tanker and transferred more than 1.1 million barrels of oil. Um, it held to the replacement uh, vessel Yemen, left the site um, aboard their multi-purpose vessel alongside two other support vessels. The Yemen uh, was the ship formerly known as the Nordica. The completion of the work marks the end of a pivotal chapter in the UN-led operation to address the threat of a major oil spill that could have been caused by a leak in or destruction of the Safar tanker. The UN Development Program, which implemented the Safar, Safar, Safar uh, salvage project. We uh, and the broad group of partners that support the Safar project have so far succeeded in preventing the worst case scenario of a massive oil spill, spill in the Red Sea which uh, with obvious potential catastrophic uh, environmental, um, humanitarian, economic uh, repercussions. Uh, however, critical work remains, including the delivery and installations of a specialized buoy to moor the Yemen to the Safar uh, for safe storage of the oil, as well as the towing and recycling of the Safar tanker. The Yemen cast the Yemen cast off from the Safar last night to a holding anchorage pending the installation of the specialized buoy. To complete the project, $22 million is still required. Generous member states, the private sector and the global public have already provided $121 million U.S. million in funding to prevent a humanitarian, environmental, and economic catastrophe in the Red Sea. We are counting on further generous support to finish uh, this critical mission. Um, and moving to Sudan, uh, we have a quick update for you from our colleagues in the Office of the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. In West Darfur, the UN Population Fund has deployed health and social workers to support thousands of displaced and vulnerable women and girls with reproductive health care and protection uh, services, including for survivors of gender-based violence. In eastern Sudan yesterday, UNFPA delivered enough productive health supplies to support 150,000 women and girls for three months at the Port Sudan Maternity Hospital. In Gadarov State, team from the UN refugee agencies have been distributing cash assistance to more than 830 Sudanese families forced to flee the conflict. Mm -hmm. And the White Nile State, uh, UNICEF and its partners have launched a child survival campaign. More than 43,000 children under the age of five are receiving measles vaccination. Children suffering from severe acute malnutrition are also being treated immediately after screening. And on Zimbabwe, you'll have seen that we issued a statement yesterday in which the Secretary General said he was closely following the developments in the elections in that country. He said he is concerned about the arrest of observers, reports of voter intimidation, threats of violence, harassment, and coercion. The Secretary General called on political leaders and their supporters to reject any and all forms of violence, 
threats of violence or incitement to violence to ensure that human rights and the rule of law are fully respected. The Secretary General also called on political actors to peacefully settle any disputes through established legal and institutional channels and to urge the competent authorities to resolve any disputes in a fair, expeditious, and transparent manner to enable that the results are a true reflection of the will of the people. And a quick update from Gaza, um, the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestine refugees in the Near East, better known to you as UNRWA, said in a statement yesterday that nearly 300,000 Palestine refugee children are back to school in the Strip to respond to the increasing needs and to accommodate an increase of over 4,600 uh, children this year. UNRWA recently opened three new schools in the southern part of the Gaza Strip and in Gaza City. And just to note that, as you know, UNRWA has been facing chronic funding shortages. Uh, the agency warns that without immediate additional funding, it will be unable to maintain operation beyond September. The agency requires nearly $200 million to continue delivering services this year and to pay its staff. Um, on Guatemala, I know I've been asked by some of you about reports of legal actions being taken against prosecutors and former members of the uh, Commission Against the Impunity in uh, Guatemala, the International Commission, known as SIGIG. I can tell you that the Secretary General notes with concern reports of recent raids and arrest warrants against Guatemalan prosecutors and former officials of the uh, Commission, uh, notably uh, Claudia Gonzalez. Uh, he recalls the, imp the important contribution of dedicated justice officials and during its period of operations of the Commission and its personnel to fight against impunity and corruption. And just lastly, some of you may have seen um, that one of your former colleagues, Warren Hogue, passed away last week. Warren was the chief correspondent of the New York Times at the United Nations from 2003 to 2008. During that time, he, um, he covered with his exquisite prose and intellectual insights some of the most challenging years for the late Secretary General Kofi Annan and for Ban Ki-moon. After retiring from the Times, Warren moved to the International Peace Institute, where he remained deeply involved in international affairs and kept in touch with so many of you. We extend his, uh, as we extend our condolences to his wife, Olivia, and their children, we remember Warren as a true gentleman reporter who was unfailing in his kindness, his easy grace, and detailed reporting of the ups and downs of this institution. Edie. Uh, thank you, Steph. On behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association, uh, we would also like to send condolences to the family and many friends of Warren Hogue around the world. Um, he was a ter terrific journalist who reported from South America, Brazil, London, and many global hotspots before coming to the United Nations. Um, as you so rightly said, he was a charming man and a great raconteur, and he will be greatly missed by all of us who knew him. Okay, uh, any, uh, do you have a question? Yeah. Yes, you may. <laughs> <laughs> Does the Secretary General have any comment on the one of the Libyan rival government's decisions to suspend the foreign minister for meeting Israel's foreign minister. Look, uh, we, we have no particular comment on whatever bilateral contacts may have had. I think we are concerned about the, the, the safety of the foreign minister. There are reports that she's been threatened uh, and that she had to flee uh, the country. It is imperative. Uh, her safety is is paramount and imperative. I've never, I, I, I'm not begging for questions, but <laughs> did they? Did you guys all drink decaf? True, true, Deji, true. yeah. Okay, yeah, I, I'll take it. Um, Two questions. First, um, on Syria, we know that uh, on Monday morning, uh, the Aleppo International Airport has been attacked by what the Syrian government claimed Israeli forces. Um, 
just want to know first, is there any impact for you in operation there in that region? Mm. And your second question? And, and second, the Syrian foreign ministry uh, put out a statement that said it's a flagrant violation of the UN Charter and it's uh, disrespect for international law and international humanitarian law. Uh, do you agree with the, the Swiss statement? On Syria? Yeah, I mean, what I can tell you, uh, your, your, your initial, um, your first question, uh, it did lead to the airport closure and the cancellation of at least uh, one flight uh, from the UN's humanitarian air service and uh, Aleppo is a critical uh, is a critical hub for that uh, we're very concerned about these uh, reported airstrikes uh, the secretary general strongly condemns all violence in Syria urges the parties to respect their obligations under international law I think it bears reminding that civilians and civilian infrastructure must be protected under international humanitarian law and he urges all parties to exercise maximum restraint to prevent further regional escalation. Michelle. Sorry? Maybe, maybe one of your colleagues can lend you a microphone. It's so nice that your microphone's not working. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'll enjoy the moment. Yeah. A bit away for a week, do you Yeah, I know, notice? yeah. Um, uh, on Turkey and Russia and yeah. the Black Sea grain deal, um, a spokesperson for President Erdogan has said that he's likely to visit Russia soon. Um, and he said that after this visit, there may be developments and new stages may be reached regarding the grain deal. Is the UN involved in any of these discussions that Look, might we, be going we on? We are continuing to advocate and do whatever we can to ensure uh, the resumption of... Uh, the export of Ukrainian grain, of Russian food and fertilizer through all the, the agreements that have been, uh, been signed. We remain in contact with many parties on this issue, but I don't have anything to share with you at this point. Are you aware, aware of any potential new developments or stages? I, I think we're, we, are in a, we are not in a situation where it would be healthy to predict anything. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I have two questions on Rohingya issue, Bangladesh and Myanmar. Resolution on the Rohingya issue have been passed by the UN General Assembly and UN uh, Security Council, and the USA has imposed sanctions against the military junta. Despite these efforts, the situation has not improved. By this time, six sir, years. Sir, I, I just I beg you to find a question mark. Yeah, Bangladesh has undertaken pilot project to repatriate the Rohingyas from Bangladesh to Myanmar. How United Nations can support the effort of Bangladesh for the safe, dignified, and sustainable return of the Rohingyas to their homeland, Myanmar? Okay, first, uh, I think it is important to note again the, the generosity of Bangladesh and the Bangladeshi people in hosting uh, the hundreds of thousands of refugees uh, and the host communities uh, that, have taken, that have taken them in. Um, UNHCR is in the lead on this issue. Uh, we have an overarching principle that all return of refugees should be done in a, in a voluntary, uh, safe, and dignified uh, manner in a place that can, um, in which they, they can feel safe. Uh, and I think I, I, would, uh, I would leave it at that for now. However, my second part of this mm -hmm. same issue some refugees living in Cox's Bazar shelter camp are now engaged in various criminal activities. Concerns are growing about disparate Rohingyas becoming involved with radicalization. Everyone recognizes the necessity of finding a permanent solution to the Rohingya issue to maintain regional and global peace well, and stability. I think on the, uh, on, uh, yeah, on, the, on the issue of what is actually going on in Cox's Bazaar, I would ask you to ask UNHCR. Thank you. Yvonne, then Linda. Thanks. Um, given that gender equality is such an important issue for um, the Secretary General, I just wondered if he has any comments on this row that's engulfing the Spanish football chief, um, Luis Rubiales, and uh, over his allegedly non-consensual kiss of the Spanish footballer, Jenny Hermoso. Does he have any comments? I mean, how, how difficult is it not to kiss somebody on the lips, right? 
I mean, we the, the, there is a a critical issue of uh, of sexism that remain in sports, and we hope that the Spanish authorities um, and the Spanish government deal with this in in a manner that respects um, the rights of of all female athletes. Sorry to clarify. Yeah. So he does see this as a sexual assault. I, 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 that is a criminal term, right? I mean, it, from what we see here, there's, I, I don't see any indication that anything was consensual. Uh, sorry, Linda. Uh, thank you, Steph. Uh, regarding Afghanistan, <clears throat> excuse me, we know that Mr. Gordon Brown was here a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things he talked about was the education of young girls, yep. and I, I, including informally, mm -hmm. um, and including informally and things like online, you know, online learning. And I was wondering if there was any information or any update in terms of how successful that is, if there's been itsy-bitsy progress. Uh, we, we can check with his office. I haven't seen any anything on that. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Steph. On Niger, as you probably saw on Friday, the Nigerian coup authorities gave the French ambassador 48 hours to leave France. And then today, President Macron said that there is no intention of the French ambassador leaving Niger, excuse me. Does the Secretary General have any reaction to these developments in Niger? I know that the French president also reiterated support for President Bazoum and the yeah. ECOWAS. Process. Well, I mean, on our, on our end, our, our support for President Bazoum and, and the elected uh, government of Niger continues. We continue to call for uh, a return uh, to the constitutional order. This is a bilateral issue between Niger and France. I would say also that it is imperative that um, the diplomatic protocols be respected and that people be kept safe. Uh, it is, um, and then we'll come. Um, Steph, two, two things. First, um, I asked you, I think, last week about the remarks of Mr. Uh, Gordon Brown regarding um, what he said when he was here, that the ICC should prosecute Taliban. Yes, it's, for it's on my punch list, and I didn't do my homework, okay. but I will. So, and another issue... Um, a human rights watch issued today, um, sorry, a human rights watch issued today a report regarding spike in Israeli killing of Palestinian children. And they also urge, uh, and they say that the number is, uh, the last year number was the highest in 15 years, and then uh, this year numbers are on the way to be probably um, highest than last year. Well, I mean, and they urge the Security Council to put Israel on the uh, list of shame that he didn't do last year. Look, on the two things, I think if you look back to the the last briefing by Tor Venisland, I think he highlighted the rise in numbers and that we'd see the highest numbers of, of civilian deaths uh, in a long, long time. Um, on the issue of children in armed conflict, uh, there is a metho methodology that was followed. Um, and it's followed every year, I think, in a very straightforward uh, way. Ms. Gamba, on behalf of the Secretary General, reported for last this year, or last year, rather, for 2022. Or uh, next year, you'll see the report for 2023. Uh, one second. Uh, sir, and then, um, and then Evelyn, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, regarding uh, Syria and ISIS, as you know, the issue of foreign terrorist fighters in SDF uh, custodies in northeast Syria is an like, extremely complex problem. Uh, like, do you think like does UN want the countries to take responsibility for their foreign fighters through like prosecution or rehabilitation program? Or yeah, what I mean, it, what should be like the it, it is important. I think we've we've said it very clearly that a countries take responsibility for its citizens, mm -hmm. uh, especially for the families, the women, and the children. Uh, that have been left uh, behind in a number of camps uh, in Syria and, and in Iraq. Some countries have, but it is important that they all do. Evelyn, and then we'll go to the screen. Um, thank you. Um, about the BRICS, which we spoke about last week at length, um, with the exception perhaps of Argentina, none of the new or old members seem to have any regard for human rights. Is that something that 
bothers the Secretary General? Did he mention it? I, I think, may have forgotten uh, from his. For, first of all, he's you know, he's not the Secretary General of the BRICS. So who's a member of the BRICS is up to the BRICS themselves. I would ref I, I, I would refer you to uh, what he said very clearly on I'm sorry I'm losing track of time on Thursday at his press conference in, uh, in Johannesburg where he referred to the issue of human rights both proactively and in answer to a specific question. And that is that all human rights, political, economic, uh, cultural rights among others need to be respected. And it's not either or. It's not because you respect your people's economic and cultural human rights, you, you don't need to respect their political rights. They all need to be respected. And I think he was very, look at the transcript, he was very clear on that. Okay. Sorry, I saw that. I just wondered whether... Well, I mean, that, that was an answer to, to the exact same question you asked. All right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go to the screen and we'll come back to the room. Um, uh, Maggie and then Mushfilk. Steph, um, could you address the Human Rights Watch report from last week about the Saudis allegedly shooting uh, Ethiopian and other African migrants? On their I, I, I did, and I, I thought fairly eloquently last week. So I don't. I would mm -hmm. refer you to what I said because usually okay, take two is not it. as good right. as take one. All right, uh, I'll go back and check. But can you. I just ask? Um, was it Mr. Grunberg briefed on it? Because some of these uh, migrants are entering Saudi from Yemen. So was uh, he I can aware check. I, I can brief? check if if he was briefed. Uh, if he was briefed on it. Okay, and um, just just to follow up on Niger, uh, where's the special representative for West Africa right now? And has anyone in the UN spoken to President Bazoum in the last few days? Uh, I will have to check in the last few days. I know uh, through various channels we've been in touch with him on a regular uh, basis, just checking in on him, making sure he's okay. Uh, and I will check on Shimao. Uh, Mushvik, and then Iftikhar. Thank you, Stefan. I have a couple of questions on Bangladesh. Can you hear me, please? Yes, sir. Concerning safety and freedom, 160 war leaders, including former UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, President Barack Obama, and 100 Nobel laureates wrote an open letter to Bangladesh ruling Prime Minister, alarmed that Nobel laureate Professor Bangladeshi Professor Muhammad Yunus has recently been targeted by the judicial harassment. They also urge for free, ensuring a free, fair, and participatory national election in the coming months and the respect for all human rights. What is the UN Secretary General position in this critical situation of the Professor Muhammad Yunus as he is engaged with the UN in various capacities? Well, as we've said before, we very much uh, want to see, and I think everyone wants to see, free, fair uh, elections uh, coming up in uh, in Bangladesh, and I will check on on Professor on Professor Yunus. I was not aware of the case. Uh, uh, Bangladesh uh, Bangladeshi government using country's code to block the opposition leader voices in all types of the media. Today, one of the court has ordered the Bangladesh Tele Regulatory Commission to remove all recent video statement of the main opposition leader Tarek Rahman from the social media. And a PhD student at Michigan State University, Tanzil what, 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 what is the question? I, I really would like to keep this so, briefing focused on questions as opposed to statements. And I'm not just so saying my, that to you, my, but to all. My, but what is the question? My question is uh, someone from the outside criticizing the government, like a PhD student, but his mother arrested in Bangladesh. So how the country is, or a member state, you know, the. I, I'm, I'm, not I'm, not, I'm not aware of this uh, particular case. I can tell you is that we very much, again, hope to see free and fair elections in, uh, in Bangladesh. Okay, Ma Iftikhar, please. Thank you, Steph. First, deepest condolences on uh, the passing of uh, Warren Hogue, a personal friend, and now a question that I ask every couple of years. A huge sporting event is taking place later this week in Pakistan and Sri Lanka, the Asian Cricket Club, uh, Cup 2023. Does the UN have any involvement in this event? Well, first off, I love to watch cricket. I understand absolutely nothing about cricket. 
but I think cricket, like uh, football and, and rugby and many sport played around the world, has great potential to bring people together, to bring countries together, to bring cultures together, and, and cricket does that. Uh, I will check with our local country teams if they have any involvement uh, in, the, in that specific event. You're not going to ask me about Australian rules football, are you? No. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. Absolutely not. Um, in Uganda, a 20-year-old man has become the first person to be charged with aggravated homosexuality, which is an offence punishable by death. Would the Secretary General like to respond? We, we were, came out, I think, very strongly against uh, the law, uh, fearing that uh, persecution could, could happen. Um, and I think we're just seeing that now. Ibtisam uh, Azam. Thank you. Um, so uh, um, Amnesty International issue, issued a um, statement saying that um, two days ago, uh, or three days ago, saying that META should um, immediately pay reparation to the Rohingya for the role that Facebook played in the ethnic cleansing of the, uh, and persecution. Do you have any comments on that? And which role do you see that social media uh, should, like, um, should be held? How should they should be held accountable uh, in their well, platforms? So, social media companies throughout the world need to do a better job at ensuring that their platforms are not used to spread hate, uh, messages of violence, uh, disinformation. And we've seen it over and over again that it actually has been happening, uh, whether it's in well-documented cases like in, in Myanmar and in many other cases. Um, there are, you know, uh, individuals, groups, civil society groups are uh, free to use uh, national judicial systems to try to seek um, uh, to, to try to gain, let's say, gain cause uh, on these issues. But it's clear that social media companies have a responsibility and a very real one, and that's a message we've passed on to them as well. Did, do you believe they should pay also reparations? I, I think that, that would be probably for a court, uh, for a court to decide. Okay. Uh, Paulina will brief, and a reminder, 2 o'clock, for those of you who are interested, uh, Mr. Wane right here in this very room live from Bamako.